welcome to UC Max Grand Rounds. I'm Britt Guest. And I'm Scott Kobener. How are you doing, Britt? I'm good. I think I want to start this show off a little different. All right. I want to talk about a case that I recently had because I would love your thoughts on this. I was a little baffled on what was going on. So I had this young guy, maybe 35, mm -hmm. came in um, and he was just saying, I feel really itchy and my skin's kind of yellow. So I'm already starting to think that there must be something probably wrong with his liver. Um, but he tells me that I've, he's just had this tooth infection. He's been taking Augmentin. Um, he was prescribed some narcotics but didn't really want to take them because he was recovering from drug addiction and just didn't want to go down that road again. So he's taking a lot of Tylenol, like four grams of Tylenol a day. Nobody really, he didn't read the instructions there on what the max dose was. He hadn't taken Tylenol in about a week. And he actually said that he had just been to a hospital. They checked his liver enzymes and they were 800. But he's like, cool, I don't want to be admitted. I'm just going to leave. And that was yesterday. I respect that move. I respect that. <laughs> so now he's coming in and he's saying, I'm just more itchy. I'm just more yellow. What are you thinking about in this patient? Yeah, I mean, there's like such a wide differential for this patient, especially if they're coming into your urgent care. Um, there's a lot of things, I think, on this differential that you're probably not going to address in the urgent care setting. Probably not keeping. Everything from, you know, you've, you've got evidence that this person probably has some stigmata of either acute liver failure or some mm -hmm. liver dysfunction. Mm -hmm. But it could also just be hyperbilirubinemia from something else, mm -hmm. right? So you have to think about there are new drugs. Is this a weird G6PD like deficiency oh that you haven't oh thought boy. about <laughs> since the beginning? Is this some other type of hemolytic anemia? Yeah. Is it somebody that has, I don't know, maybe they have like a pretty asymptomatic or in transit choledocolithiasis causing some backup. Maybe this yeah. oh, two things, a big red herring, all that stuff going on. So there's a lot to consider here. I think in order to treat this person, we've got to do a lot more lab work, yeah. maybe some imaging and a really good exam. Well, in the end, I'm telling you this story because he, I thought it was the Tylenol. I'm thinking, whoa, you've been taking way too much Tylenol, four grams every day, but he hadn't taken it for a week. Sure. Yeah, the good news is, I guess, he'd be very dead if there were a big <laughs> overdose a week later or and something, And he was right? very alive with sure. very stable yeah, yeah, vital yeah. signs. And he actually he had no abdominal pain, so I wasn't really concerned about, like, gallstones or anything like that. Turns out I call poison control, like, oh, my God, this is, like, Tylenol overdose. I'm super worried. And they're like, no, 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 it's not the Tylenol. It's the Augmentin. And I was like, what? Drug-induced liver injury from Augmentin. Can't say I've ever heard of that, and I will continue to prescribe a whole bunch of Amoxclav <laughs> to a bunch of people who need it, but that's a pretty rare complication. It's rare, but it's actually one of the most common medications that causes wow. this drug-induced liver injury. So. That's just a little segue into one of the segments that we have coming up for you tonight. We're going to be talking with Dr. Sean Nort, our pharmacy expert, on things like this. Things that we prescribe really often that have some pretty <laughs> gnarly side effects. Things to keep you up in the night. Perfect. Yes, Love it. exactly. All those things that we prescribe all the time from urgent care, but can have some bad complications that we probably should know about. Right on. All right. So what's coming up in the MRAP universe? Got a bunch of stuff coming up. Uh, some big away games, some live events. So if you're in Las Vegas for whatever Woo! reason, uh, if you're not already going to UCA, we'll be there. Um, we're speaking on the 14th of April. It'll be a really fun day. We'll have a booth, a bunch of goodies to hand out. So come see us there. If you're in Las Vegas, maybe even fly out, drive out to come say hi. It'd be wonderful. Also, that same week, we're going to be at SEMPA in New Orleans. Um, so if you like sweating in high humidity environments <laughs> and great food, this is the perfect spot for you. And that'll be- Sempa is the place. <laughs> yeah, Sempa. That'll be on the 16th of April. So it'll be a lot of ping-ponging back and forth if you're flying to both of them. Awesome. We've got some awesome faculty with us tonight. We have Josh Russell, we have Jan Schoenberger, and we have Sean Nort. And of course, in the chat, answering your questions live, please put lots of questions in the chat. We've got Mike and Gita. All right, what do we have coming up next? I think next up, we have images of the evening. Let's do it. It was all a dream. It was all a dream. All right, guys, welcome to Clinical Images of the Evening. Um, I sat down earlier this week with Mike and Gita to run through a couple images. The first one we talked about is this, this rash. Let's hear what Mike and Gita had to say. 
So, Gita, you know, you've heard me talk so many times about the importance of the onset, and this is not going to be a huge mystery. It's sort of unlikely that this patient just happened to develop a zoster rash suddenly while he was swimming in the ocean. But if you looked only at the rash without knowing the events surrounding the onset of these symptoms, you might think this is something like zoster, which are those, you know, vesicles on the erythematous base and a dermatomal distribution that don't cross the midline. But if you think about it globally, it is not any type of <laughs> diagnostic uncertainty. It seems pretty clear that something stung this person in the ocean, and this was probably a jellyfish sting. I think the patient is probably right. And I would agree with you that sudden zoster while swimming in the ocean uh, seems unlikely, less likely. I mean, certainly that rash by itself without the history uh, would you could have a, a much wider differential. But now that we know the history, I think I think it's safe to say that this patient is probably right. And they're probably having some pain, um, stinging sensation from it. So when they come in, one of the things that we have to do is address their pain. And another thing is to think about the nematocysts that were on the tentacles that may not have I don't know what did they deployed their venom. I don't know what they do. Do they explode? I don't know. <laughs> so they haven't released their venom yet. So one thing you can do in the urgent care to help with the pain is hot water. Hot water apparently is better than cold if you can muster it. So hot water immersion or hot packs are supposed to be helpful. Um, there are all sorts of, you know, wives' tales about having someone pee on it. There's a famous episode of Friends about like someone offering to pee on a jellyfish thing. And um, vinegar used to be... Um, something that we recommended, maybe not so much anymore. So really hot water is probably the way to go. And then trying to get those cysts off. Um, some people advocate using something thick like a shaving cream or actual uh, sunscreen and slathering that on and then using the edge of something like a credit card, something firm and plastic to try and scrape up those nematocysts to get them off. And then re-immersion in hot water again after that. And hopefully that'll be enough. Most people do fine um, unless they do have some particular kind of jellyfish where I guess if you live in a certain geographic area, you would have your antenna up for the kinds of jellyfish that could lead to a really serious envenomation. But, you know, around where I live, it's usually just a run-of-the-mill ouch jellyfish stings for a little while and then you get better. All right, so a little bit of clinical context might have been helpful there. Um, so this was, in fact, somebody who developed acute sudden onset flank pain while swimming in the ocean. Again, they're talking about a jellyfish sting, so that is what this image is. But as you can tell looking by it, you might initially see that and think, well, maybe it's shingles. Uh, looks a lot like shingles. It passes over a few dermatomes here, and with that history, so important. There is an awesome review article in Annals of Emergency Medicine that talks about kind of the evidence base of how we should be managing these things. And I think initially, you know, you get stung by a jellyfish, either your friend's like, hey, I'll pee on you, which is not necessary unless they really want to pee on you, um, or you put vinegar on it. So a lot of lifeguards will actually have vinegar in their tower to put on these jellyfish stings to this day. But the evidence shows us that that probably isn't very helpful. It might just cause more pain unless it's a blue bottle jellyfish and somehow you know that. Um, all right, so this was jellyfish dermatitis. Moving on to our next image, this is a young woman coming into your urgent care. She has had one month of some decreased hearing on the right side. She's had a little bit of drainage from the right ear. No fever, no ear pain. You take a look in her ear and this is what you see. Let's see what Mike and Gita have to say. This is one that can fool us because, you know, nine times out of 10 or 99 out of 100, this is going to be something like otitis media that's ruptured. And you're going to probably think about antibiotics and send the patient out the door. The problem is, is that that one in 100 or one in 1,000 type of occurrence could be something more serious. And what we're really looking at when you take a good look at this picture is a coleostoma. And I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but this is like epithelialization of the cells of the canal that then start growing into the bone. And this can result in permanent hearing loss. And this can also, interestingly, have that foul smelling drainage. The thing is that this will require ENT referral and 
absolutely is not something that's able to be treated with antibiotics. Gita, this is a curious thing. I'd have to say that in my career diagnosing this, uh, not not something that I've commonly done. How about you? Uh, I would totally agree. Um, I think that pronouncing it is probably the the least of our problems. <laughs> I think that recognizing it. So I would say that the thing that would really clue us in is the is the drainage. Like that's going to be our friend if you if they come in with this history and say like it's the drainage has been going on because I think the the history of these is often that someone's been treated for, with. Um, maybe antibiotic drops for an otitis externa, or they've been treated for otitis media, and they've come back a few times and they still can't hear, and it seems like things are getting worse. And then you look in there, and then I mean, you know, it sometimes it's really hard to see what you know to really know what you're looking at in the TM. And I know that in um, the March, I believe UC Max, Josh Russell did a really interesting segment with an ENT who said that sometimes the ENTs don't know what they're looking at. <laughs> so I don't know if we need to blame ourselves, but when a cholesterol is on the differential, then I think we really need to, um, we just first need to recognize that it's a possibility and know that it's a dangerous diagnosis. And I would think of this like it's not a cancer, but I would think of it like a locally aggressive cancer because it will go in and just... It's like a it's like a cyst or something that kind of eats everything in front of it and it will destroy the the bones of the ear it will it will eat into the bone it will cause a lot of destruction and that person will have a permanent loss of hearing um and so you really do need to act fast so this is a person where that if that's on your list i mean worst case scenario you were wrong right and you you maybe rang the bell a little loudly and like okay and they say okay that wasn't it but I think that's far better than trying to pretend that this is otitis externa over and over and over again, and then having this pe- this person, you know, lose their hearing and suffer the consequences. And so, yeah, this is, I would say, an important one to know about and to keep on your differential because, um, can I say it? If it's not in the differential, it won't be in the diagnosis. <laughs> All right, so the diagnosis here is, in fact, cholesteatoma. Um, This is really hard to diagnose. As you see, when you look in that ear, man, that can just look like a bad TM, maybe a perforated TM, oftentimes could be misdiagnosed as just acute otitis media. And maybe this patient got a lot of antibiotics before somebody really noticed, wait, I'm not looking at the eardrum. In fact, I'm looking at a overgrowth of epithelial cells, and that's exactly what this is. Um, Those cells actually can erode into the bone, into the ear, into the middle ear, and cause permanent hearing loss. One of my friends from medical school actually had this and has permanent hearing loss in that ear. So a diagnosis we don't wanna miss, pretty rare. Uh, The third and final image tonight is this. This is a 25-year-old female. She's taking a lovely romantic sunset stroll along the beach, and bam, suddenly she feels terrible pain in her ankle, and she felt like she probably stepped on something squishy that slid away. Let's see what Mike and Gita have to say. Well, you know, I've actually never tended to one of these injuries, but it sounds like this is an injury due to a stingray, stinger, barb, um, if that's the right word. And what I know about that is that they are venomous and so they can cause a lot of pain, but it's not just from the envenomation, it's because that thing is usually still stuck in the foot. Uh, So you're gonna have to think about getting that out and treat their pain initially. The first thing that you wanna do is inactivate it in some way. And I think similar to jellyfish, we're gonna reach for the hot water. We're gonna try and use a hot water immersion. That's gonna help a lot with the pain. And then we're gonna talk about uh, some other steps. We're gonna update their tetanus. And then, Mike, what are we gonna do? They got this thing in their foot. We're gonna wanna try to remove that barb. And if we can do it from the non-serrated side of the stingray embedded you know, barb that's in your foot or whatever it might happen to be, right? That way we'll decrease the chance that we're going to give ourselves more of that envenomation, right? But the other thing to think about this is that Vibrio vulnificus, which is something absolutely we want to try to prevent. So in addition to updating their tetanus, just like you said, we're going to try to give some prophylactic antibiotics. And with everything, I always feel like if we can give that in the urgent care, if we have those, the sooner you get that prophylactic antibiotic going, the better, of course, right? And the medications that we're going to use, we're going to stay away from the quinolones, but doxycycline or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole are going to be the primary antibiotics that we're going to do. 
you mentioned about an X-ray, and certainly that it has to have a pretty good sensitivity to be able to see something. But if we have any concern whatsoever by either blowing our finger over the area or by seeing something that we're not able to get out as far as an embedded foreign body, and we think that that envenomation would continue or that would increase the risk of continued infection, for example, from something like Vibrio, that patient will need to be referred. And I would say, look, you know, it's like a Friday of a holiday weekend. You can have them see like a plastic surgeon on Tuesday, I would just plan on sending that patient to the emergency department if you're not able to completely remove the foreign body. But if you can, getting that patient treated with doxy and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, updating their tetanus, and giving them you know, good return precautions about what to look for, absolutely something we can treat in the urgent care. All right. So this is, in fact, a stingray uh, sting, which is probably no surprise. But the treatment is kind of interesting here. The toxin here is inactivated in heat. That's why you want to put the person's foot in heat. You know, don't make it too hot and burn their foot. You want to make sure that you update their tetanus. You want to get an x-ray to rule out foreign body and barb from that uh, sting. You know, I grew up in Huntington Beach, and this was, like, always a problem. And from a very young age, we learned the stingray shuffle. So you always shuffled your feet when going into the ocean at any time. I still do it to this day, and I've never gotten stung by a stingray, so I guess it works. Um, The thing that we asked in the chat was if anyone would give prophylactic antibiotics to this patient. 75% of you said no, but actually you probably should be treating these patients with prophylactic antibiotics, specifically doxy. That would be a great choice because we would really want to make sure that we cover for Vibrio. There's been quite a few studies out that compared patients that got prophylactic antibiotics and ones that didn't. And there was a pretty high chance of getting an infection and coming back needing antibiotics in those that weren't prophylactically treated. So something to consider. All right, so that was our stingray sting. Now for our mystery image of the evening. You have a seven-year-old female. She's coming in with sore throat, fever, and a rash. You look at her mouth, and you see this. And then you look at the rash. You can see this on the back of the neck and on the stomach. And when you feel it, it's really kind of just this very fine, bumpy, rough rash. Any thoughts on what this could be? The person that answers correctly in the chat First wins, not my, uh, not Scott Kobner's car, not this time, but you will win AirPods. So put in your answer, tell us what you think. And now we're going to our next segment. We're going to be doing procedure of the month with uh, Dr. Scott Kobner, and this is management of headaches with nerve blocks. We're going to be doing the procedure of the month. This month, we're going to be talking about the procedural management of headaches. A little issue with our slides as we're going to get set up here. Hopefully, you can see me on the screen. But with our procedural management of headaches, I want to go back through the long history of actually doing procedures to take care of all the pains that people have experienced in their head. This is a tradition as old as time. We go back to the Neolithic era. People were hitting each other with rocks over the head that entire time period. That's the birth of anesthesia. Go forward another 200 years, we're trepanating skulls to get rid of migraines. So we've been drilling and poking and prodding into people's brains to try to relieve a headache for a really, really long time. Today we have a little bit more of a robust understanding of what actually causes headaches, specifically migraine headaches. And you know, all of the really interesting neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuro-ophthalmologists have talked for a long time about the relationship between our cranial nerves and the rest of the sensation in the meninges, that fifth nerve. It seems that there is a sort of feedback loop that occurs with the trigeminal nerve and a branch of the autonomic fibers that come off of the sphenopalatine ganglia. So today we're really gonna be focusing on sphenopalatine ganglion blocks and how you can deploy them in your urgent care. I'm gonna skip through a few of these slides now that we've fixed a little technical difficulty. There's that great picture of the birth of anesthesia. 
you know, that's what I'm going to do to the folks who mess up the slides after this show. This picture of us <laughs> drilling into skulls here. Let's talk about the block. We talked a little bit about the science. This is where this phenopalatine ganglia lies. It's way back there in your nose. Very uncomfortable place to reach, as we'll see here in a second. And this is that feedback loop. So the idea here is if we block this ganglion, we'll be ready to go and prevent this vicious cycle that causes migraine headaches. Or at least that's our understanding of the pathophysiology in 2024. In five years, don't quote me, we'll probably figure out something else and we'll be talking about some other type of block. But for now, this is what we got. What are you gonna need to do this procedure? Super easy, anyone can do it. One, a Q-tip, you know, or a cotton swab, as we call it in medicine, because we have fancy names for everything, right? Second thing you're gonna need, two, some lidocaine. Um, you'll see here on the slides, it shows 4%. We have 2% here. It doesn't really matter. A viscous solution is probably preferred. In some of the studies, you see everything from just a normal 4% solution to a viscous solution. I've actually done this with ointment or creams. You know, I know there's going to be some derm person in the chat like, an ointment actually means it has this. Whatever. The thick stuff that comes out of a tube that's not a viscous, viscous liquid, it stays on the cotton applicator a little bit better. All you're going to do to do this procedure is you're going to take your Q-tip. You're going to drop it in your lidocaine. It's magic. You're going to have it sit in there for 5, 10, 20 seconds, whatever, how long it takes you to talk to the patient, tell them what you're going to be doing for this procedure. And then the next part is really straightforward. You've probably COVID swabbed 100 people at this point. This is a therapeutic COVID swab. All you're going to do is take your gross viscous lidocaine swab and you're going to shove it in the patient's nose and you're going to go back at a straight angle just like this. You're going to get all the way in there. Oh, feels great. And you're gonna have it hang out for five to 10 minutes as I'll complete the rest of this talk doing it. No, absolutely not. Five to 10 minutes, it's uncomfortable. You can lay the patient back a little bit and just have them sit in there, let them ride it out. When you look at the evidence behind doing this block to reach this phenopalatine ganglia, it's a little bit mixed. This paper is from 1996, it was published in JAMA. This is like the landmark paper as to why we should be doing this block to help alleviate migraine headaches. They looked at a primary outcome of a 50% reduction in headache within the first 15 minutes of treating the patient. They found in the group that got a sphenopalatine ganglion block, 55% of them said, I feel 50% better in 15 minutes. 21% who just got some saline shoved up their nose felt better too. So there was a statistically significant difference here. People got excited about it. This study was repeated in an emergency medicine population in 2015, I believe. This was published in Annals. Didn't show us promising outcomes. For the same primary outcome, there was no statistically significant difference. 49% of people had a reduction. 41% who got some saline shoved up their nose also felt better. It was really good saline that they got. So leaves, do I do this block? Is this how I treat headaches, especially in an urgent care environment, even in a fast track environment in the emergency department? And it's a little bit of a longer answer. I just don't go by these two studies or the few that go after kind of giving mixed results. I think it's important to remember when we're talking about treating pain, that pain is a qualia. It's a per human experience that is very subjective. And what works for some people's pain is not necessarily going to work for everybody's pain. And this is sort of the lens I interpret almost all the literature about palliative care or symptom control because what's painful to me is also partially psychologic as well. And so in the right patient, I think this is a great procedure in treating headaches. But I also remind you, we got a bunch of other stuff that works super well in the treatment of acute headaches, oral NSAIDs being the first line, and let's not forget about IV antiemetics, those anti-dopaminergic drugs that are really, really great. There's such good literature to support that specifically for migraine type headaches, you can get patients feeling amazing fairly quickly and get them out of the door of your urgent care. I throw sphenopalatine ganglion blocks in this other stuff category, along with a few other things that people often talk about, doing other nerve blocks in the back of the head and some, some other techniques for very specific types of headaches. And I pull from that box when I think it's appropriate for this patient, when they've tried everything else, or they said, hey, this has really worked well for me in the past. The best thing about this is you can also send the patient home with a bunch of Q-tips and uh, the bottle of lidocaine. If it works for them, you could easily teach them how to do it themselves and counsel them on any risks for lidocaine toxicity. Don't overdo it. Don't put like five swabs up there at one time. It's crazy you have to say that, but someone out there definitely will. That's the procedure of the month. Thank you guys so much for bearing with us. We've got a really great segment coming up next. We're doing briefcases, hand injuries. Throw it to you guys. Back at the studio. <laughs>
Greetings. I'm Josh. I'm joined by Jan and in the light board room, Sean. And we're going to do briefcases, which I just realized was a pun tonight. So bear with me for these cases. But we are going to cover hand injuries. And if your urgent care is anything like mine, people come in all the time for hand injuries. And they often think it's no big deal. But because we use our hands for almost everything in life, they can be. So we are going to go through some can't miss hand diagnoses tonight. All right, let's get things started. So. The first patient is a 35-year-old woman out for a lovely walk amongst the, amongst the uh, sunflowers and her dog sees a squirrel that seems merry and dashes after that squirrel and takes her owner with her. Down she falls, a foosh occurs as they do, and she comes in and sees us. So we're going to go to her x-ray. We get an x-ray of her right wrist. Sean, tell me what you see at this x-ray. So here we have her x-ray here, and remember, we own that entire x-ray, so we're going to focus on the area where there's pain, but we want to look everywhere. But before we do that, let's just review the anatomy, and always orient yourself to where the bones are. So you can see where the radius is, and we're going to start there. At the most proximal row of bones, there's eight bones in the hand, uh, the carpal bone, so we have the scaphoid the lunate, triquetrum, and pisiform. Then on the top row, to make it easier, the trapezium, the trapezoid is on the insoid, and then the capitate and hamate. So when we go back to this x-ray that we see, so we're looking everywhere, but then if we focus in on this area, I see an area of uh, lucency, and that is very suggestive of fracture. So back to Josh and Jan to tell us how to manage this fracture, a scaphoid fracture. It's at the proximal portion, which makes us worry about avascular necrosis based on the blood supply there. So Josh, Jan, tell us how to manage this. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sean. And Jan, he brings up a good point. And actually, in this case, the patient, I don't know if you could say lucky, but the, the x-ray shows something. And that's not always the case with scaphoid fractures, right? So how do you think about the scaphoid and considering the possibility of fracture, maybe if you don't see a fracture on the x-ray? So the scaphoid fracture diagnosis really starts with a great hand exam. So as you're starting your hand exam, you want to make sure you focus in on the snuff box and look for that classic snuff box tenderness. But even more sensitive than that would be axial loading of the thumb. So it all starts with a good hand exam before we even look at the x-ray. That's going to make us clinically suspect a scaphoid fracture. And x-rays actually are negative at about 25% of scaphoid fractures. So we will see scaphoid fractures that have a negative x-ray, and we have to treat them as such based on our clinical exam. Now the scaphoid fracture, as Sean mentioned, is a very high risk fracture, high risk for, uh, for a, a non-union due to its very unique blood supply. Most blood supply in our body goes from proximal to distal, right? But in this case, the scaphoid blood supply goes distal to proximal. It's a branch of the radial artery that comes back across the bone. So when we fracture it, it has a very high rate of non-union. So we want to make sure that we're conservative with our treatment, we immobilize and treat it as a fracture if we clinically suspect it. Well, thank you for that review. And let's talk about what you're going to use to immobilize. I kind of alluded to it here, <laughs> but um, I remember in my training, we used to do these long arm splints. It was almost like a full body cast. Is that still what we're doing for these uh, <laughs> scaphoid fractures? Are we doing something a little less uh, dr uh, draconian for these patients? Yeah, we're definitely not doing long arm splints anymore. We're doing a thumb spica as illustrated here. Immobilize that thumb and get follow up in the next one to two weeks to evaluate for the scaphoid fracture. Perfect. All right. On to our next patient. So this is a 45-year-old gentleman. He works in the restaurant just down the street from your urgent care. I don't know how many of you have had restaurant jobs, but they have a very heavy door in the back. So he's taking out the trash, props it open, and then a gust of wind blows it closed just as he's coming inside. Unfortunately, his middle finger takes the brunt of that injury. And Sean, this patient comes to you, so let me show you his x-ray and tell me what you think about it. Okay, so he's a restaurant worker and he, this is not the tip he wanted that day. You can see that. Look at where it is. You can see that lucency. So that is called a tuft fracture and there's a couple of associated injuries with that. Very often they can get a subungual hematoma which can be quite painful. So what you want to do with that is you want to trephinate that and you can do that with a hot paper clip or I like the electrical cautery and you pop that through and you can get the blood out and that makes it feel much better. But you have to assess for a central slip injury. And Josh and Jan are going to tell us the test how to see if that person has a central slip injury. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. So 
Absolutely, we see the fracture, but in ortho, it's good to remember it's not about the fracture, it's about the function. And we're going to talk about function right now. So the central slip kind of always eluded me. I didn't even, I thought it was a thing, not a, not a, I thought it was an action, something slipping, but it's actually a piece of the anatomy, right? So, Jen, tell me about the central slip. Why does it matter and how do we test if it's injured? Right, so the extensor tendon that runs along the dorsal aspect of our finger is actually pretty superficial. So these types of lacerations and injuries, they can be closed or open, can injure the extensor te tendon mechanism. So the extensor tendon runs along the back of our finger and you'll see here as illustrated that we have a central slip, it splits into three parts, a central slip and then two lateral bands that go along the side. The central slip uh, fits right into there, into the middle phalange and then the lateral bands go across the sides to the distal phalange. And so if you you get a central slip extensor tendon injury, you can have a problem with the extension of that finger. And if untreated, can be the boutonniere deformity that we all learn about. So the central slip extensor tendon can be tested for with a good hand exam. And there's a specific maneuver we're gonna talk about here, which is called the Elson test. The Elson test actually immobilizes the proximal flange and you ask the patient to try to extend. And you'll see that there's gonna be a difference between the two sides when you compare, and that will diagnose your central slip injury. So we have the next test, the next uh, slide which shows the modified Elson. I'll show you kind of what that looks like here. But you basically have the fingers serve as obstructors themselves. And you make this little heart shape, see? And you see that my fingers are symmetric, so I don't have a central slip injury. But you'll see in this picture that they are asymmetric, and that indicates that there's a central slip problem and a f problem with the extension. So the good news here is that the extensor function is, it's okay to discharge this patient. They can get repaired as an outpatient, and you just need to splint them in extension. I believe we have a slide of what that would look like. So pretty easy, you can make this with a tongue depressor. Many people have disposable little splints that you can put on, but you just wanna immobilize that finger in extension, and then you can refer them to a hand surgeon as an outpatient. Perfect, and then they can get back to their social media posts and not be the odd one out when they're making their heart signs, right? Heart hands, is that what the kids say? <laughs> All right, next case. So, a 17-year-old young man uh, is involved in a game of pickup basketball that doesn't go as planned. So, uh, in frustration, he punches that metal pole, you know, in the uh, parks that the uh, hoop is suspended from, and he regrets that immediately, but all the damage has been done, so he heads over to your urgent care. On exam, you see a swollen hand and an angry parent standing next to him. But, Sean, let's take a look at the x-ray. So, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, so here we have this x-ray, and this is where he's tender. This is usually a clinical diagnosis. When I see these patients in the urgent care, I tell them, I'm pretty sure that you broke it, and this is called a boxer's fracture, or uh, a fifth metacarpal fracture, and you can see how it's angulated. Now, this is only an AP view, but we also want to get a lateral because we really have to worry about the rotation. Now, this young man is telling us, and we always want to believe our patients, that he punched a basketball hoop, but maybe he punched the guy who was playing basketball with, so always assess for a laceration from a tooth or what we call a fight bite because the hands get affected, infected very easily and you'd want to cover them with antibiotics. But this is a boxer's fracture and then back to Jen and Josh to tell us what we're going to do with it, particularly if there's increased angulation and rotation. Okay, right. So this is a boxer's fracture. It's the most common metacarpal fracture, so all of you have probably seen many of these. But the question on my mind, and I hope you can help me with this, Jan, is it's always my thought, should I be trying to reduce this? And in urgent care, I don't have, I don't have injectable opioids. Um, I don't have a lot of support staff. So which of these boxer's fractures do I need to be addressing in urgent care? Which can I just splint and refer? Right. Well, the good news for these metacarpal fractures, which, as Sean mentioned, this is the most common metacarpal to be fractured, is that it tolerates quite a bit of angulation. So based on our x-ray, we're going to look to see how much angulation are we talking about. In addition to the angulation, we're also going to examine the hand for rotation. But as you can see here, that little finger can tolerate, the fifth metacarpal is the little finger, can tolerate up to 45 degrees of angulation. That's actually quite a bit of angulation. It gets less and less as you go more um, radially with your metacarpals. So as you go to your ring finger, your middle index fingers, they tolerate less angulation. But look how much angulation we can tolerate there. 
In addition to the angulation, we have to ask ourselves the question about rotation. And that's going to be an exam function. So have your patient make a fist the best they can, flex their fingers, and if you start seeing fingers crossing over like you do in this uh, diagram here, that is a sign that you have rotation. And that is something we really don't want to have. Because imagine how that can affect the function of your hand and your grips, your grip strength, your grip function, etc. So if you see any kind of rotation, that definitely needs, needs to be reduced. So depending on the degree of angulation, any suggestion of rotation, that those would be ones that I would want to pull on with a hematoma block or something local due to our more limited resources, which is fine. But otherwise, they don't need a lot of reduction. Okay, those are really helpful exam maneuvers and probably the only time you're going to write scissoring in your chart, hopefully. So how are we going to splint these folks? Right, so here you see the ulnar gutter splint. This works really well. You immobilize that fifth metacarpal to promote it to heal. I'll tell you that there's literature out there coming out of the UK that says that you could put an ACE wrap on this and it's gonna be fine. They heal really, really well. They're very forgiving. So, but an ulnar gutter splint is probably the standard of care here, around here. Okay, yeah, and there you'll see that probably if you have a relationship with your hand surgeon, you can call them and make sure that they want something less restrictive than this, that'd be fine. But in the absence of that closed loop communication with whoever this is, patient's gonna follow up with, I agree totally, ulnar gutter is still the standard of care here. All right, our last case. This is a 45 year old skier, which is uh, a little bit of a hint there. And she has a fall um, on her way down the mountain, thankfully her last run, but her thumb's really bothering her. So she comes over to urgent care and she's complaining of pain that started right after her fall in that right thumb. So let's take a look at the x-ray and see what Sean has to say. Okay, so this is another one where you'll have a good clinical suspicion just from the story. So she's skiing, her paw gets stuck most likely, and she falls on an outstretched hand, and that thumb gets bent backwards. And it can happen for many other reasons. This is known as a skier's thumb. It used to be known as a gamekeeper's thumb when people used to break the necks of chickens and other types of fowl, and you could get a similar type injury. And let's look at the area right there. So there's a little avulsion fracture here, but this is really an uh, uh, ulnar collateral ligament injury. So remember, the ligaments are so strong that they can actually pull that bone off, and that's where you get that avulsion. So clinically, you'll see that there's a lot of laxity here. So this is known colloquially as the skier's thumb, gamekeeper's thumb, or you should call it what it is, the ulnar collateral ligament injury with plus or minus an avulsion fracture. How are we going to manage this one? So thanks, Sean. Yeah, the skier's thumb, as you'd expect with a skiing injury, but it doesn't have to be skiing, right, Jan? It's anything that's causing that hyperabduction, that forceful hyperabduction of a thumb. And so that x-ray, this x-ray that we're looking at, shows a fracture, but is that always the case? Yeah, sometimes these have no fracture associated with them at all. It's purely a ligamentous injury, and it really causes a lot of instability at this very important thumb joint. You can actually shoot an x-ray and apply that kind of stress that actually opens up that space and stresses that ligament to confirm your diagnosis. If you want to go there, you can do that. Pretty painful for your patient. Don't recommend it for patient experience scores, <laughs> but you know you can do that, and that will show you that this is indeed an ulnar collateral ligamentous injury. Awesome, and yeah, I believe hopefully this was an image that was taken while the patient was under anesthesia. <laughs> um, and sometimes they'll go on to get MRIs because there's a soft tissue injury down the road from an orthopedist. But as we're seeing the patient in urgent care, we're suspecting that ulnar, ulnar collateral ligament sprain or rupture. What should we be doing for the patient in terms of immediate care and follow-up? Yeah, so this is another one where you could apply a thumb spike, a splint, immobilize the area, and they could be referred again for outpatient repair down the line with a hand surgeon. So in the next few weeks, follow-up. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jan and Sean. Those are brief cases, and now we are going to go to Experts Corner. Experts Corner. <laughs> with... All right, so Experts Corner. This is all honestly based off the case that I had just a week or two ago when this patient, as I kind of was talking about at the beginning of the show, came in with Augmentin injury to the liver, drug-induced mm -hmm. liver injury from Augmentin. And I'm pretty sure I texted you right after this case <laughs> like, uh, is this a thing? Have you heard about this? And uh, it is, and again, it's one of the most common drugs that causes this problem, which really got me thinking, 
what about all the other medications that we so commonly prescribe from urgent care that have some really serious side effects? Do we ever really give patients proper mm -hmm. discharge instructions on these medications? And what discharge instructions should we be giving? So the first kind of complication I want to talk about, Sean, is photosensitivity. Well, I'll, I'll, hold on a second here. Oh, no. <laughs> all these bright lights here for this fair-haired boy, so I've got to be properly here. All right. Photosensitivity is a real thing. And you and people, particularly people, I will tell you, I can get this very easily. Uh, but any skin hue can get this really within minutes and definitely hours. And it's quite interesting, probably more interesting. I mean, not enough time to say how it happens, but it actually causes the body to absorb more of the UV light, both UVA and UVB. And it's based somewhat on the structures of these. But these are the big offenders, right? Fluoroquinolones, tetracyclines, absolutely, and sulfonamides, particularly trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim or Septra, all very commonly used medications. So, I mean, how bad is this? Like, is a patient going to melt in the sun? Is a patient going to get blister burned in the sun? What, what are we actually going to see from this photosensitivity? And what should we be telling patients at discharge, to, like, stay out of the sun completely, wear a hat, use sunscreen? What, what do you tell these patients? All of the above. I would tell them really stay out of the sun for prolonged periods of time. Wear sunscreen while you're on this, any kind of UV shirts or things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you know, if they're on a three-day course, hopefully it won't be too bad. But if they're on a seven, 14, 10-day course, you absolutely need to tell them. And they can get severe, severe burn beyond just a sunburn. You could even get a second-degree burn with these. So you want to make sure that these patients and some of the people, so urgent care, people do do primary care. And you could have, uh, let's say, an adolescent who's on minocycline or doxycycline right. for acne, and they're going to be on it for a long, long time. So you really have to know, let them know because we don't want to increase their skin cancer risk, you know, years down the line. All right. Great point. Great. I mean, these are really common antibiotics. Cipro, doxy, we prescribe this all the time. But do we really tell patients as often as we should about this photosensitivity and sun exposure? I probably don't. So I'm learning something new. Okay, let's talk about pooping because antibiotics often make people poop, but antibiotics can also cause the very feared C. diff. Which antibiotics are big offenders here that we need to be thinking about? So pretty much any antibiotic has been reported to, but the big offenders are the ones that you see here. Now, cephalosporins, particularly if they're inpatients, it's a phazolin, but cephalexin or keflex is the big one. And why are those to, I think it's a large part because they use them so much, right? Mm -hmm. So you just have a larger group of patients that are being exposed. But when you look at the epidemiology, cephalexin by far is the leading cephalosporin. Clindamycin, we don't use that often, but clindamycin is probably, mm -hmm. arguably, the, the one that causes it the most. Mm -hmm. Amoxicillin and fluoroquinolones, and we have ciprofloxacin up there. Now, you know, people can get antibiotic-induced diarrhea, right? right? That, I mean, and that's my next question, because antibiotics cause a lot of diarrhea for people. So when are we telling patients this diarrhea is okay, but this diarrhea isn't? So absolutely. So look, at amoxicillin is probably the one that does it the most, mm -hmm. right, on this list here. And it can be intolerable to some patients, right? They just can't tolerate it. But antibiotic-induced diarrhea usually stops very soon after the uh, prescription ends and they shouldn't have abdominal pain, they should not have fever, and if you got blood work, now everybody knows a leukocytosis is, doesn't really tell you anything, but if they had abdominal pain, fever, continuous diarrhea after completing that, and a leukocytosis, yeah. definitely start worrying about, could this be C. difficile uh, colitis and diarrhea? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, checking a white blood cell count might not be something we always do for diarrhea, but specifically with C. diff, for whatever reason, I'm sure there's a reason and I just don't know it, that white count is really high. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, a lot of, I mean, Keflex, probably the antibiotic I might prescribe <laughs> the most. I mean, these things really have some serious complications. All right, so I want to give fluoroquino fluoroquinolones their own slide here because I feel like they are almost attached to every terrible side effect known to man. Aortic dissection, retinal detachments, your Achilles tendon's going to explode if you take these. I mean, they seem pretty dangerous. These are a lot of dangerous complications. 
Should we even be prescribing fluoroquinolones? So this is what I would say about fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones, I think, with very rare exception, are always second or third line agents, particularly in the urgent care setting. You should stop and pause and say, am I, why am I prescribing a fluoroquinolone? And usually they should have failed another antibiotic or they cannot take it. I absolutely tell my patients about tendinopathy yeah. with this. I tell them don't do any explosive sports like tennis and things like that. Even one or two doses have been associated with tendon rupture because of this. The aortic dissection, retinal detachment. Several fluoroquinolones have been removed from the market because of torsadin killing people, right? So look for drug-drug interactions. Use your pharmacist. So you mentioned about photosensitivity. The pharmacists are excellent about uh, putting the stickers on and counseling patients, but use your pharmacist. But fluoroquinolones really, in my opinion, should not be the first med that you are writing for for most if not every indication without very uh, good reason and exception. Yeah, I mean, I have quite literally never discharged somebody with Cipro and said, oh, hey, by the way, if you develop tearing back pain and chest mm -hmm. pain, you should probably go to the ER because you're having an aortic, aortic <laughs> dissection. Yeah. Never said that before. But I mean, really, it's something that we need to be considering. And uh, like you said, not using this as a first line agent for most things. Okay, so to get to the meat and potatoes of this and why we even did this segment was drug-induced liver injury. Because really it is, I'm gonna be honest, it's not something I ever really think about mm. and it's certainly not something I warn people about at discharge. So tell me about the two types of liver injury we can get here. So with your case, and, and amoxicillin clavulanate, as you mentioned, yes. is really the poster child for this. There's about an instance about one in 2,000 to 3,000. There's estimated to be 30,000 cases of drug-induced liver injury from amoxicillin clavulanate alone. Now, fortunately, once the drug stops, most of those people get better. Right. There have been deaths. Uh, re associated with that were pretty uncommon. But as Britt has here, cholestatic is exactly the picture that you put. Someone's going to have uh, jaundice. They're going to have scleroicterus. They might say, hey, my urine's dark, right? right? They might be pruritic like your patient was. And that's what uh, amoxicillin clavulanate does. Hepatocellular is what you are appropriately thinking of acetaminophen right? And that's when you actually have damage to the hepatocytes themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives you the transaminitis, right? Your guy had a mild transaminitis, but with really bad acetaminophen and other drug-induced hepatocellular injury, we see a transaminitis with 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, mm -hmm. huge numbers. So when we look at cholestatic, we've talked about amoxicilloclavulanate, cefazolin, right? You may give this in the urgent care setting, right? There might be an indication if you had an open fracture and yeah, there's all, you know, different practice settings. And then azithromycin, can cause this. Uh, erythromycin, there was one salt that was notorious for doing this, and pregnant women really don't use that drug anymore, but azithromycin can. And then from hepatocellular, you want to talk about a med we use a lot? Nitroferantoin, <laughs> right? Isoniazid, right? I think most people probably remember somewhere when they had pharmacology in school, oh, something about where well, the fast acetylators, slow acetylators, right? Uh, so isoniazid I, can do it, but those patients are usually on it for prolonged therapy, so your pharmacist or ID or, you know, most urgent cares, I don't think, are treating people with isoniazid for long-term, you know, uh, active TB, right? But they might come in and always think of this with drug-induced li uh, liver injury, and then the tetracyclines can do it, but particularly minocycline. And remember, those are the ones, that drug is most commonly used in those teenagers mm -hmm. or as somebody who's using it for acne. So anytime you have any liver injury, you want to consider medications because often if you can stop it, it gets better. If you don't think about it, someone else might not think about it, but you want to look at your hepatitis panel. You want to look at everything else, of course. This is a diagnosis of exclusion, but a diagnosis just the same. And it's a scary one. I mean, you see this person, you assume they're in florid liver failure. They're jaundiced, they're itchy, and it's just augmentin. <laughs> so uh, now that we've terrified everybody about prescribing these very common antibiotics, what would you, what are your words of wisdom here as a pharmacist, as an ER doctor? 
what should we be doing in general? Do we do better discharge instructions? Do we need to be warning people about all of these possible side effects they can get? So I, of course, I have the luxury of being a pharmacist, right? So I do <laughs> sp probably speak uh, more about medications with people, but I always put in my aftercare, I have very detailed ones, and I always say discuss particularly any of these meds with your pharmacist. The pharmacists love that, but I would, I do mention, uh, I think the omeprazole and clavulan, it is one just to mention and say, hey, if you start having abdominal pain, because as Scott mentioned, early this is very very common but I see at least I'm the second person seeing them but I see a lot of people I'm like why is this person on amoxicillin and clavulanate right amoxicillin mm -hmm. alone probably could have been right so that often should not be the first med I mean we're not talking about you know cat bite or human bite or mm -hmm. something right but if it's like a run-in-the-mill otitis first time presentation in a child just use amoxicillin uh, but then the other ones you have to you don't want to scare people from not taking right. their meds right <laughs> so I do mention the tendinopathy with uh, patients I do look for the fluoroquinolones if they're on it or I'm prescribing it, and I do look for the drug drug interactions. I will tell you, I don't warn people about nitroforantoin, uh, about hepatocellular stuff. Uh, I, I just don't. But uh, how the patients read that package insert that comes with their prescriptions, too, I know there's a lot of information there, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they should at least kind of peruse it. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much to our expert and for answering all these questions about all the crazy things that antibiotics can do. Our next segment coming up is a fun game called Transfer versus Keep. I do not appreciate the not-so-subtle analogy of human patients navigating the healthcare system and the industrial processing of produce. Patients are not produce. And to imply that you're, uh... <laughs> All right, so welcome to this fun game we like to call Transfer versus Keep, which kind of isn't named correctly because we're transferring from the urgent care to the emergency room, or we're keeping in the urgent care and dispoing from the urgent care. So, Transfer versus Keep. All right, so I have my lovely panelists over here. Uh, they have paddles. One says K for Keep, one says T for Transfer. Let's see what they say about some of these cases. All right, so your first case. This is a 27-year-old female otherwise healthy, passed out, she doesn't know why. She's coming in to see you. Her vital signs are stable. Her exam is completely unremarkable. You get a screening EKG and you see this. Transfer or keep? 50-50. Okay, I will take Scott for the keep. For the keep, I just noticed looking at the shot, was, I feel like we're in like a police lineup here. <laughs> <laughs> it was the guy in the hat. Yeah. Uh, no, anyway, so this is uh, a young, otherwise healthy, I'm presuming, person who had a sinkhole episode. Looking at this ECG, uh, the thing that stands out to me right away is you got that kind of classic delta wave. You got a shortened PR interval. Um, so this looks like someone with WPW. So I said keep because if this person is hemodynamically stable, they're well appearing, they syncopize, they're back to normal, and you don't feel like there's anything else crazy going on, sure, you could guess that this is from most commonly SVT being triggered by WPW. Um, if I worked in the emergency department and I got this, I would get them a cardiologist appointment and they'd set up some monitoring for this person and they would probably discharge them. I don't think this is somebody that needs prolonged cardiovascular monitoring. Um, it's a pretty through and through cause. If this is what we're assuming is the reason going on and it all depends on the patient's access to care. If I can get somebody hooked up with a cardiologist, I'll just skip that step and get them where they need to be. All right, I like that answer. We asked the audience and 75% of them said they're gonna transfer this patient. So Josh, why are you transferring the patient? Well, first of all, we have a very smart audience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Ooh, burn. Uh, I mean, I can't talk to a cardiologist from urgent care. I can't uh, arrange a Holter monitor. These are the kind of things that are the loose ends that need to be tied up. Um, an echocardiogram is usually in order. So she doesn't probably need a lot, but. Like Scott said, she's young and otherwise healthy. And to me, that's scary because this is a sentinel event for somebody who might have a very long life ahead of her if uh, I do the more conservative thing. So probably the highest risk patient I'll see all day in urgent care and definitely would send her to the ER. All right. 
I love the debate. I love the 50-50. Let's move on to the next question. This is a 35-year-old gentleman. He has no medical problems. He is coming in with one day of right lower quadrant pain, and you do a quick dip of his urine, and he's got some hematuria. Transfer or keep? All right. So we've got keep for the majority of us. Sorry. Uh, oh. No, I was keeping. I was so oh, keeping. I just put it down too fast. Sorry. You're keeping. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sean, why are you keeping this patient? So again, just to qualify, if I think that this is a renal stone or a urinal stone, and this is pain that's going around to the flank and gross hematuria, and if I have an ultrasound, which I know a lot of places don't, and I throw it on, I say hydro, I feel pretty comfortable with that. If I have point tenderness in the right lower quadrant, maybe I would re rethink that. But if I'm thinking that this is a stone, even if he has hydro, I'm feeling pretty comfortable in sending him home. All right, well, back to Josh, because you're transferring. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it depends on, is this somebody who has a history of stones? Is this somebody who has tenderness or not? So if this is somebody who has a history of stones and they are clearly uh, having the same presentation, the pain is kind of colicky and coming and going, I feel much more comfortable. But if this is somebody who's got the first time presentation and or tenderness, fever, anything else, um, and or somebody who can't control their pain, I guess there's a lot of things that could go wrong or could push me in that direction. But if it was 100% classic stone and the, he was comfortable in urgent care, very reasonable to send him home. All fair points. I'm not giving you much information here to be fair, so it's more for the debate and the conversation. We asked the audience, and 100% of you, 100% said they were gonna keep them in the urgent care and discharge from there. So, next question. You got a guy, he's young, otherwise healthy. He's gonna be honest, he got a little drunk last night, got in a bit of a scuffle, punched someone, and now his hand hurts. He's coming in and you see this. I will tell you, you get an x-ray, there's no fracture. Transfer or keep? Oh. Well, that's not fun. You're Connect all unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fun. Jan, why are you keeping this patient? Well, you told me there's no fracture, so therefore this is not an open fracture or fight bite, technically. It is a laceration. Now, yes, it is contaminated with human saliva, and I'm going to wash this out, and I'm going to put the patient on antibiotics, but if there was a fracture, that would be a different story. This is a laceration. So that can be set home. How does fracture change your management? Well, I mean, so obviously you're sending them, but what are you more worried about now? So if, if there's a fracture underneath it, then this is an open fracture, which is a fight bite, which we referenced earlier. And this needs IV antibiotics and it needs more of a washout, whether that's in the OR or you know, in the ER, whatever, I'm consulting somebody and we're getting it washed out. All right, well, everyone agreed, so that's not so fun. Everyone <laughs> would keep, okay. All right, next question. You've got a 30-year-old guy. He's coming in with a headache. He said he was at the gym lifting weights when he suddenly developed this headache. Um, he has a completely normal neuro exam, totally normal vital signs, no other medical problems. Transfer key. Uh, uh, commit, commit, and we're done. <laughs> it's locked in. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Scott, you're being ballsy. You're keeping this person. <laughs> uh, my paddle's broken. It only has one side. No. <laughs> she's she's uh, keeping I mean, everyone. <laughs> I think with, like, all of these cases, right, like, the suggestion here is it's an exertional headache. Um, you know, it might be a subarachnoid, but there's also a case where, like, this is what happens when I try to work out. Clearly, I don't do a lot of that, you know? Um, so there's a case to be made if this isn't historically, like, the worst headache of this person's life, and they're like, actually, this happens every single time I go to lift weights, and I've been living with this for 25 hours. Like, I can see this being a case where there's enough historical features that I'm not actually worried about a subarachnoid clinically. But obviously, if I was concerned at all, do not pass go. Please go to the emergency department. All right, the He's rest playing of devil's advocate. I, I love I love that about you. Um, the transfer. The rest of you are transferring. Who wants to make an argument for transferring? Well, I would say this is one where I think you're going to talk about the uh, Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rules and the studies that have been done looking at CT scans and their sensitivity and how it declines rapidly after the headache begins. So these are almost always shared decision-making cases in reality. Like you have to see how risk tolerant the patient is and. Um, weigh your own sort of risk in mind. But because the workup uh, for subarachnoid involves a non-con head CT, basically, if it's within six hours and if that's normal, you can kind of close the door on that, then there's a limited amount of time. So this is somebody I'm going to encourage to go so they avoid being stabbed in the back with a large needle. <laughs> All right. Well, 
the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rules we have up here, this is taken from Corpendium, and I kind of think of it as like the perk score. You have to answer all these questions, and if you answer no to all of these, the likelihood of them having a bleed is super low. But we do answer, at least based on the very limited, limited history I gave you, that it was exertional in onset. He was lifting weight. So we can't completely rule out a bleed. So kind of like with you guys, 65% of the audience said they would transfer, some are going to keep, maybe shared decision making is going to play a big part in that kind of decision. I think yes. different than the other ones, an important point to make here about transferring. Um, in all the other cases, if you're going to mm -hmm. transfer, like personal vehicle seems like a good mm -hmm. option in a lot of ones. If there was a high suspicion somebody was like yeah. actively bleeding into their head and could have a seizure mm -hmm. or something, like that might be a time you'd want to <laughs> have a like qualified medical professional at least escort that patient. But you know, yeah. the rest I think you can make a, an argument that Absolutely. personal vehicle is probably yeah. acceptable. Absolutely. All right, we're going to do one more question. I'm gonna give you this x-ray. This is a young, otherwise healthy guy. He fell on an outstretched hand. He's having shoulder pain. You get this x-ray. And I will tell you on exam, the skin is intact, but there is tenting. Transfer a key. Split down the middle. All right, uh, Jan, transfer, why? Well, you said there's tenting. I so did. So I am going to, A, assume that the place I'm sending them actually has an orthopedic consult, which if they didn't, I would not transfer. Um, and that does apply. I mean, you have to know what your local resources are and what you're really transferring for. Um, so if there's an orthopedic consult there and you're describing tenting, then to me that says that the skin is you know, at risk. There could be necrosis of the skin if I give it more hours. This is most certainly a surgical clavicle. Most clavicle fractures are not surgical. I wouldn't be transferring most clavicle fractures, but this one will be surgical. Although, maybe not emergently, it's all about this tenting. That is the word that is triggering me. T for trenting, T for transfer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, Sean, I believe you put keep up there. I would. I agree with everything that Jan said. It all degrades. So like, I'm just looking at the soft tissue here, and it doesn't look like there would be a ter terrible amount of, of tenting. I would speak to the patient very clearly and tell them exactly what Jan's concerns were, and if this was getting better or if there was any skin change to immediately come back. But if I could sling them and get them ortho follow-up where I know they're going somewhere in 24 hours, maybe even two days, I'm pretty comfortable with discharging that person as long as we're all in agreement on uh, the plan as discussed. All right. So we're going to wrap it up because we're running out of time. Thank you so much, panelists. Stay right where you are because I have more questions. <laughs> so a little bit of a wrap up here. We had this awesome uh, image by uh, Dr. Joe Moran. Thank you so much for submitting that. And the answer. What's the answer, guys? Scarlet, scarlet fever. fever. Scarletina rash? It is scarlet fever. Yes, it is. Um, and we have Shane... Shane, I don't have a last name. Shane Soldier, I believe. Uh, you won. You also won in February. So uh -huh. instead of getting another pair of, <laughs> of AirPods, we'll probably send you something a little bit more exciting, like maybe an MRAP swag bag. So send us your information. Um, also, I wanted to make a shout out. We did a lot of splinting and talking about splinting and fractures. There is a phenomenal ortho fundamentals series on MRAP that goes into incredible detail on a lot of these fractures that you will see in urgent care and has a great section on all the different splints, how to perform them. Um, really great. Check it out. Okay, guys, we had some questions that came in. First one to, let's see, first one to Jan. You talked about axial loading of the thumb. Can mm -hmm. you describe what that means? Yeah, um, so axial loading of the thumb would mean basically, axial is like upward downward pressure, so like downward pressure on the thumb, loading the thumb, which basically means that it's gonna collide right into the scaphoid, and that's gonna, if there's an injury there, it's gonna cause pain. So think about where that scaphoid is, which is right there connecting to the thumb, and if you axial load, push down on the thumb, you're gonna get pain in that injured scaphoid. Cool, love that. Uh, Scott, Yeah. question for you. You talked about our sphenopalatine ganglion block, Someone asked, asked, could you just use let for that? That's a great question. I mean, I don't think you're really getting any extra benefit by including the epinephrine um, in there at all. You know, the idea is having the lidocaine seep through the mucosa and reach the ganglion that we saw was way back in there. Uh, in fact, I think just the thicker solution that you have on hand would be the best thing to make sure it's really seated over there. I don't know of any research about using lead in that way, but generally we're not putting lead inside of people. Yeah, um, I, I would agree entirely. So what epinephrine's added to lidocaine, it, it helps us 
by causing hemostasis, but it's added to keep the lidocaine or whatever it is to work longer. So it's going to keep it from being further absorbed, and I think it's going to be counterproductive yeah. in, in here, and you'd probably be leaving it in for a longer period of time. And Scott used the viscous lidocaine because that's going to adhere to the mucosa mm -hmm. a lot better than just the liquid itself. Cool. Uh, one last question. People really like the jellyfish stings. Sean, mm -hmm. there's all of these things that we talk about and wives' tales that you should do. Someone mentioned rubbing alcohol. Any evidence for that? There is. So I would uh, actually, one of our Corpendium uh, talk section editors wrote that excellent review article that you referred to, and it'll answer every question that you have ever had. So <laughs> isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol has been uh, really the best thing to do is you can uh, uh, use shaving cream or uh, sunblock if you have it. Use a credit card and kind of scrape it because there might be some of those nematocysts that are still there. Uh, people just want to pee on people, right? It's just weird. <laughs> Don't pee on people. And the vinegar can make it worse and the isopropyl can make it worse. Now, warm water, every marine toxin is heat labile. So warm water, but when you have just regular water, sometimes that causes some osmotic change and they can actually cause those nematocysts, which are uh, where the, the venom is. So that's why if you can scrape it first and then warm water is usually the best thing to do for that. I've never seen one of these, but I'm just imagining how traumatic it has to be at the beach and some guy's trying to pee on you, another one's swiping a credit card on you. <laughs> you got rubbing alcohol, it's like a whole production. <laughs> yeah, it's real awkward <laughs> real quick. <laughs> All right, so that is our show. Our next grand round is coming up. That will be May 1st. Uh, remember to check us out at the UCA conference April 14th. Thank you so much faculty for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to our amazing production team. None of this is possible without you. And thank you audience for joining us. We'll see you next month.